Welcome to The Work of Warriors, a podcast dedicated to bringing mental wellness to the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kim Ravage. This podcast is dedicated to the artists we've lost to mental health, addiction, and suicide, and to those who are still suffering in silence. Today's guest is Ryan Dusick, an associate marriage and family therapist and the founding drummer of the very popular band Maroon 5. After multiple hit songs, two Grammy Awards, and over a million albums sold, Ryan found himself suffering and without direction as his career as a performer came to an end just as it was taking off. Struggling with both physical and mental health challenges, Ryan finally overcame his struggles in 2016 when he began his journey of recovery. He has culminated a new life path full of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. His story is very inspiring. Now a mental health professional and author, Ryan is spreading the message that recovery is possible and some astounding things can come with it. He recently released his book, Harder to Breathe, a memoir of making Maroon 5, losing it all, and finding recovery. In one of the many praises for Harder to Breathe from the band, James Valentine says, Harder to Breathe is not only a detailed chronicle of the early days of the band, but an inspiring story of redemption. Ryan's personal journey is inspiring and will remind those in need of help that change is possible. I'm so excited to introduce to you Ryan Dusick. Thank you for being here. Hi. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. You have an amazing story. Um, I I don't know what you know about the work of Warriors. The podcast is brand new, but essentially it's to encourage both artists and really everyone to take care of themselves first before their career, before their families. Um, you know, we live in a culture that is so we're so conditioned to think that, you know, we have to give and give and give to everyone, to our careers, to our dreams, even before taking care of ourselves. And then once we make it, then we'll take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as you know, and you have accounted in your beautiful memoir, it doesn't work well in that direction. Very true. And I appreciate that you're um, advocating in this space because, you know, I, I certainly um, didn't have any perspective on that when I was going into that world, you know, and um, there was no public discourse about these kind of things. So to be able to have that now is definitely um, going to be helping a lot of people for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here again. I love the book. You did a great job. It was such an entertaining account of, you know, the history of the band and your experience. You had my attention from start to finish, um, just because of the way that you told it and you're funny, um, but also just your authenticity and just the genuineness of the true ups and downs of the industry of success, relationships, adolescence, adulthood, college, everything. So um, what inspired you to write the book? Well, I had always liked the idea of writing a book, I was, I loved creative writing when I was a kid. It was a passion of mine early on, along with baseball and then eventually music. Um, and so much so that when I tried to figure out what my major in college was going to be, I, I chose English because I figured that other than music, my only other thing I could really invest myself in at that level is writing. And so uh, I got my bachelor's degree in English. And, and for the longest time, I, like everyone else that's supposed to studies, you know, literature thinks I'm going to write my I'm going to write the next great American novel someday. Right. Uh, so that was always in the back of my mind, but it was one of those things that kind of fell by the wayside when my life was music and it was the band for a long time. But then after I left the band and I was in a really dark place in my life and really struggling to figure out what uh, the meaning of it all was, um, I did have the idea of telling my story in some capacity. And uh, I knew that I had some stories to tell because the band had gone from this thing we started in my parents' garage uh, and went all the way from there up to over the course of a decade playing the biggest stages in the world. 
So I knew I had a story to tell. There was a lot along the way that was interesting. And I knew that some of the things that I went through um, were both interesting, but also tragic and heartbreaking. And so I thought about writing a book, but the only problem at that point was that I didn't know what the purpose of it would be other than to just tell some stories, right? Say I wrote a book and, and maybe, you know, break some people's hearts <laughs> in the, along the way. Uh, so I decided not to do it at that point. I was actually even approached by someone who wanted to do a book, like co-write a book or do that kind of thing. And I also said to myself, you know, if I'm going to write a book, I'm going to do it myself. Uh, but then fast forward, uh, maybe another five, 10 years when, um, I was in a better place in my life. I was back in school and I was sober and I was studying psychology and I had all this new passion and purpose in my life. And it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, this tragic story that I've been telling myself about my life and what I had and what I lost now had a happy ending and it had this new place of fulfillment and purpose and meaning. And so that's when it, it really clicked that I had a, a story to tell that could actually impact people in a positive way. And that's when I started. It wasn't even a choice, really. It wasn't like I need to write this book. I just woke up and it started coming out of me and I had to sit down and start typing and get it out. Yeah, I love that. That's exactly what the work of Warriors is all about, is for those of us who have suffered and who have experienced darkness, whether it be addiction or anxiety, depression you know, suicidal ideation to then have the end, you know, not the end, but the next phase of the story be one of celebration where we are thriving to be able to share that hope with other people. So again, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here to tell us about it. I'm curious. I know that you have a lot of praises from the band, but I'm wondering, was that risky at first? Was that, what, what did that, what was that process like? You mean uh, showing them the book and, and seeing what they were going to Thanks. Yeah, just, you know, I think for most writers, when you're, ta when you write a memoir, it can be intimidating and uncertain, whether it's family members or friends, when you're recounting stories that involve a lot of other people, especially in the public eye. Yeah, there was a lot of consideration that went into that for me, and it was a process. I was very careful when I wrote it, you know, in terms of who I showed it to early on and how much of it was allowing myself to have. Uh, the ability to express myself without self-censorship um, and then take the time to go back and figure out where is the line here in terms of what is the real purpose of this and what is serving that purpose and what is not. Uh, because at the end of the day, my intent from day one was never to write something that made someone look bad or, you know, to attack or, you know, mudslinging or anything like that. And it was also not you know, there's a fine line between telling rock and roll stories and that kind of thing and having it turn into a sort of salacious tell-all. Um, that was never my intent. I knew that there was a mission for this book that was solely focused on, um, you know, offering some people hope in if they could see, you know, in my struggles, if they could relate to my struggles, see some hope in recovery or um, finding new, new purpose in life. So, uh, but that being said, you know, I think that relationships are really important to all of that. You know, obviously a big part of our life, our lives is relationships and it's a big part of our mental health and our wellness. Um, the people in our lives are very relevant to the topics that I'm writing about. Uh, so I wanted to represent my relationships in a very honest way. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I was respectful. Um, and then the other thing that was also a consideration is like, of course, people are going to want to hear some celebrity stories and some of the things that you got to do behind the scenes, that kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was relevant, both just for entertainment purposes and because it gave context uh, to the life that I was living in those years. Uh, but again, without the intent of doing something salacious or, or trying to make someone look bad. Um, so there was a constant negotiation in my mind of making sure that I was walking that line, but also not to, to censor myself prematurely, because I, I did want to make sure I was being honest and getting it all, all out on the page before I, I scaled back and made any choices in terms of what to cut. Sure. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it's powerful. 
there were several points where, you know, oftentimes I'm, I'm listening. I have both the hard copy and the audible, but um, I was listening at one point and it was early on in the book, I don't know, maybe chapter three or something. But when you were talking about when Kurt Cobain died mm. and you, you spoke about the connection and the reflection that you had on your lyrics in the band and what you guys were writing and how, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going to do it any justice, but you know, where you talked about, this isn't just a vibe, this is real. And mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that reflection that you had after he passed with the music yeah. you were creating. It was a wake up call. Um, you know, for me, I loved that music of the early 90s, the whole alternative rock scene of Seattle and the gr grunge music um, for a lot of reasons. But mainly, you know, I was entering and in, in, in a phase of my life in which I felt alienated and disconnected and disillusioned, um, which I think are, are common, typical things for teenagers to go through. Um, it was just a particular mood at that time in history that it was very much uh sort of a cool thing to be brooding and dark and mysterious and and my heroes were that i mean kurt cobain and eddie vetter and chris cornell and uh these guys that seem to really exist at the intersection of something very vulnerable and wounded and something very powerful and uplifting you know my favorite was probably Chris Cornell Soundgarden is probably my favorite hard rock band of all time. And Chris Cornell, I mean, who, who embodied more that intersection of powerful and, and vulnerable better than him? Cause his lyrics were so heavy and so personal. Um, but then this soaring voice and incredible power and the music had such power to it. Um, so, you know, there was the element of really feeling seen and heard and understood by these artists. They were representing me better than anyone I could see at my school and my other, you know, role models around me. They were the people that I felt like, okay, these people get it. Uh, but then there was also that element of this is, um, you know, a moment of pop culture that is, it's cool to be, um, you know, depressive really. And then, so we kind of walked that line early in our career, like being inspired by those artists and, and even writing lyrics that were heavy and dark and uh, introspective and sometimes nonsensical too, let's be honest, it was the early 90s. So a lot of the lyrics were a little bit <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Uh, so, but then, you know, when, when, when that happened, when, when Kurt Cobain, you know, takes his life and you realize like, this isn't just, this isn't just a, a, a trend. This isn't just pop culture. This is a mental health crisis. These are people that are actually really struggling and the music and the lyric that they're writing is their way of coping. It's it's the expression of something really personal and really dark. And perhaps, you know, writing those songs and playing that music was what kept them alive just as long as 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 they were. And I had the same experience when when Chris Cornell passed, uh, just I think it was 2017. Um, I was just a year sober at that point. I was just about to celebrate my first sober birthday. And then, you know, my biggest hero of that era of my adolescence, um, uh, dies and of, of the things that I had been struggling with, you know, it was depression and anxiety and, and substance use and, and to see again, you know, just a big reminder of, of the, that line that we walk between, you know, being vulnerable and understanding the sides of us that are um, wounded and dealing with them, but also not succumbing to them and not 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 allowing ourselves to get to that point where we've become, you know, um, an expression of that darkness. Um, so I, I try, you know, because I, to this day, that music speaks to me more than any other music. The music of, I think that's true for anyone. Whatever was your, the music you connected to in your adolescence, I think that sticks with you forever because it feels like your moment of coming of age. So I, to this day, like if, if nothing else is connecting with me, I'll turn on, you know, Soundgarden or, or the, the Red Hot Chili Peppers or, you know, uh, Smashing Pumpkins or stuff like from that era. Um, but then I have to remind myself, it's like, 
I also need the light in my life. You know, I need things that lift me up and don't just, just connect to that dark side of me, but that also allow me to see the other side of that coin. Because I think there's darkness inside of all of us. And if we deny it, um, we're probably denying a big part of our existence. But at the same time, there's also light in all of us. And if we spend too much time in the dark, we're going to probably miss out on the things that uh, make it all worthwhile and give us that that connection to something more uplifting. Thank you for saying that. It's so, but I think that's probably one of the biggest driving forces of the work of warriors is that darkness that we all have within, within us that so many unfortunately think or believe or just don't know the resources and we're not talking enough about it, that that's just them or that it will feel that way forever. Or that's the only way to feel. And so I just love that you said that because so many of us have wrestled with that darkness. Um, and it's, you know, it's someone else coming alongside us. It's it's resources, it's people talking, um, normalizing not only the complexity of the music industry, but normalizing the complexity of being human, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean... It's it's interesting. The space that I've been in at this point in my life in mental health and and now getting out and being an advocate, um, you know, I try to occupy a space of, of vulnerability as much as anything else. I think we need um, role models, in particular men. You know, I think historically men feeling like they can like it's OK to be vulnerable has been difficult. And I think that that's starting to finally change. Um, and so much of the time you see, you know, this almost sort of toxic pos positivity <laughs> offered as the solution um, to the, the things that, that, that hold us back sometimes. And while I think we need that kind of encouragement and we need uh, the motivation and inspiration to be uplifted at the same time, um, you know, I think that we need to feel understood and seen and and all of us carry with us these this other side of us that um, isn't always up to this, this hyper positive <laughs> expression of what life is. And look, I think as a, as a clinician and as a person and as a person who is, you know, in this space of advocacy, what comes up for me over and over again is the idea of balance. You know, I think that any extreme solution is probably one sided. I think that there's a balance in us, there's the yin and the yang, you know, and um, and I think that comes up in in most things that I talk about as a therapist. Um, you know, we're never very rarely just one thing, <laughs> you know, and and our solutions for things. Um, we, we don't need to see them as 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 binary. You know, we, we, there's a there's a balance to the way that we approach our our wellness. Yeah, I agree. And I think language is powerful. Mm -hmm. Conditioning is powerful. You know, and I always think about how it's commonly, you know, conditioning for men that vulnerability is weakness, right? Right. And so I have so much compassion for men because when I see men, whether it's my clients or even the guys I live with, the guys in my family, um, you know, when they come forward with vulnerability, I just have respect and compassion for the fact that at varying degrees, men have learned that it's just not safe. And some mm -hmm. people have physically experienced that it's not safe to be vulnerable, whether that's on the playground or from their father or a big brother or a friend or whatever, you know, in sports, name it, it's, it's all over the place. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if you, I wasn't planning on going here, but mm -hmm. if you would be willing to speak to that a little bit about what can we say to strong, successful men who also are afraid to be vulnerable because they've been taught and told and conditioned that it's weakness. Yeah, it's tough. And I have experienced that in my own life. I think that, um, you know, I, I have identified as a, re a rather sensitive guy most of my life and and pretty pretty in touch and and comfortable with the idea of being vulnerable and uh, you know as we used to say in touch with my feminine side right um 
that being said, you know, I, I think that I'm recognizing at this point in my life, looking back, how much that was not acceptable in a lot of the, the places that I, you know, certainly as an athlete, as a kid, as you described, um, most of the culture in, in, in sports is about being tough and about, you know, just pushing through and, and pushing it down and just, um, you know, be a man, get out there and take it like a man. And, um, and so that was sort of antithetical to my being as a kid, even though I loved sports and I did have a, a competitive streak and I enjoyed, um, you know, pushing through and trying hard and trying to compete and win. Um, there was always something about that culture and connecting with men, you know, the coaches that I had and the teammates that I had um, in high school in particular, playing for the varsity team in my, my high school uh, in baseball. Um, there was just a disconnect and I felt like there was a large part of me that was, didn't feel seen or, or didn't feel like it was safe. I certainly felt bullied even, you know, I mean, I had, I had a couple coaches that were really cruel, uh, and, and, uh, and teammates that were really cruel, not in a physical way. I mean, thankfully, uh, I was never bullied, you know, and beaten up in that sort of way, but you're absolutely right for a lot of people, whether it's their, their peers or their parents, um, you know, an expression of any kind of, of sensitivity, vulnerability, femininity uh, in a boy is is met with violence. So um, I, I can imagine that if it was tough for me, um, allowing myself to to embrace that fully uh, as somebody who was relatively comfortable with my, my sensitive side, that for people who come from that background where in their family it is not acceptable uh, and it was it was a, a genuine threat, they would be that much harder to overcome and to allow that in. Now, that being said, I mean, I work with, with men all the time as a therapist who are struggling with this very thing, you know, and, and these are oftentimes very successful men, people who on the surface seem to have it all together. And, uh, you know, they're tough guys, you know, who are taking, providing for a family and, and, uh, and outwardly looking like strong, powerful people. Um, and then inside, they're really breaking down, you know, and it starts to bubble to the surface in a lot of different ways and sometimes in really tragic ways, you know. Um, and it's it starts in the therapy room in a safe space, you know, the ability you don't have to necessarily wake up one day and walk out into the world and be this, um, you know, this big open wound, you know, and show your vulnerability to the world. If you have one space that you can allow yourself to soften and to feel emotion, uh, a place that you know is safe, you know, whether it's a therapist or a loved one, a partner, um, you know, a sibling, somebody that, that you, a best friend, you know, somebody that you connect with, that you can allow yourself to have that vulnerability, just having the ability to express that side of yourself, to embody that side of yourself and process those emotions, those, those emotions that might not have been safe in a lot of environments in your life. Uh, that goes a long way, I think, in terms of beginning to work through the, the pain and suffering that you can go through when you're just shoving those emotions down and not dealing with them. And then in time, I think it becomes a way, uh, it becomes a process of finding a way to, to find that balance. Again, the word balance, right? Between, um, being the, the tough person, the strong person that you want to be, um, and embodying, embodying that side of, of yourself that, that it can be a wonderful thing. It can be wonderful to be somebody who has resilience and fortitude and all, and all of those things that, that allow us to pick ourselves up and keep moving and, and move forward. Uh, but also allowing in the sensitive sides and the vulnerable sides and making space for that and how, how you strike that balance so that you're not rejecting a whole part of you uh, or just pushing it down and then seeing it come to the surface in other ways that were uh, not foreseen and sometimes can be, you know, rather toxic. Yeah. And our culture, you know, I think has tricked some of us into, I know I fell for it for a long time that, you know, women had, you know, females had certain emotions and men had other emotions and not as many um, you know, as a therapist, what have, you know, what have you learned, you know, from your previous life, but to now, what emotions do men actually have? Well, this is just one man's humble opinion. Um, 
it's fun, you know, a certain amount of education, but also personal experience, uh, both as a man and as a therapist, you know, working with people and seeing in my anecdotal experience, the things that come up. And in my experience, and in my opinion, uh, we all have the same basic emotions. We all experience uh, the same vulnerabilities, the same desires, the same things we're longing for. We all have basically the same needs as well. That there are, I mean, the biggest difference is that there are, there are certain emotions that are culturally sanctioned uh, for men and for women, historically speaking. Um, I think that for, for, from the time you're a very young boy, um, you know, anger and aggression are much more acceptable for a boy in, in terms of how you express yourself. Sure. Uh, than to be a crybaby, let's say, you know, uh, or to 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 show a longing that's that's unfulfilled, you know. Um, I think there's a difference in the way that we treat that and what's considered acceptable. And it's it's not even necessarily overt messages that we always receive about that. Sometimes it's just the culture; it's the covert messages that we receive yep. about what's yep. acceptable. The images of what our role models are, the things that we see uh, that inform the way that we act. Um, and then you look, there are some hormonal differences, I'm sure, that, that, that play a part in this, too. I mean, certainly testosterone can make someone more aggressive, uh, and, and that might ap appear on the surface as anger or other uh, things that are, we associate more with masculinity. Uh, so there are some, some differences that I think that are, that are natural in that regard. But at the end of the day, they come, what, we've, what I've learned as a therapist is that underneath anger are more vulnerable feelings. Uh, underneath it, usually there's fear. Or there's, uh, you know, um, insecurity, some kind of uh, something that's that's lacking and, and needing um, fulfillment. But the expression sounds more aggressive uh, sure. when it comes from that place. But look, I've, I've met plenty of women who can be pretty angry, too. I've, you know, I, So it's, it's not like one uh, gender um, has, you know, a monopoly on any one emotion. I think we all experience these emotions and some of it has to do with the family we grew up in. You know, if you grew up in a family in which there's a lot of yelling and screaming and that's what, that's the way that you expressed yourself, then you're probably likely to express yourself in that way. Um, if you grew up in a family in which there was not a lot of expressed emotion and it was not something that you did with to, to, you know, wear your emotions on your sleeve, you're probably more likely to bottle it up, um, and have it come out in other ways. Uh, so, but we're all, we're all susceptible to all these things. We're, we're kind of, it's, it's not a, a linear thing. It's not like, oh, well, here's your gender. Here's the card that is going to be played out in your life. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to this. There's a lot of, uh, different moving parts that inform the, the ways that we experience emotion and the way that we express it. Sure. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, one of the other pieces I loved about the book is when you were talking about when you got the bus. And you, I, I, it gave me hope when I heard you say that there wasn't as much um, debauchery or nefarious behaviors going on as you had expected. And you said, you know, I suppose some of that had to do with like corporate, um, you know, engagement with bands and stuff and the culture had changed. But um, do you think that, or is it in your experience, or do you think that it will be more commonplace, more normal for touring bands to have therapists, mental wellness coaches, you know, physical wellness coaches and such on tour. Is this conversation normalized in that environment? Like, what are your thoughts as far as the mental health piece? Oh, yeah, I think you're, I'm starting to see that happening already. I mean, there's, there are organizations that are geared towards that very thing. Some of them nonprofits, some of them very specifically, like I'm a member of something called the Music Industry Therapist Collective. And uh, that's a, a UK based group uh, that is essentially a group of therapists that used to work in the, in the music industry and transition into becoming mental health professionals. And uh, they have a book out about that very thing, uh, touring and mental health. And it's kind of a, an encyclopedia on all things that come up uh, with your, your, your wellness and your, and your mental health on the road. Uh, it's, I mean, it's something I wish existed 20 years ago when I was touring. Um, but, you know, I've, I've met with uh, uh, several people with several organizations and groups that are doing that very thing and, you know, doing work of advocacy to, to try to promote, um, you know, conversations about this stuff, but also literally going and working at festivals and on tours and providing those services. And I think that what you're starting to see 
Um, I actually wrote an article about this for Variety magazine, um, which, which introduced me to a lot of these people. Uh, but what you're starting to see is that finally, at least the artists are recognizing that their wellness is a big part of their instrument as much as their voice or their body or their, uh, you know, their, their guitar or drums, um, you know, being, being well and, and, you know, being able to care for oneself uh, in mind, body and spirit in the midst of the pressures of performance and touring, uh, that's as much a part of, you know, how successful and sustainable your career is going to be as anything. Right. And so I think that, you know, as you see, we've had, you know, how many, too many uh, stories, tragic stories of people that ended up breaking down in one way or another, whether it's a substance abuse issue or suicide or just, you know, melting down and having, uh, you know, a, a, a total nervous breakdown and having to cancel tours or, or career ending type of stuff. Um, that's not sustainable for a business either. I mean, the people who are the promoters, the people who are the record labels, um, if they want to make the kind of money that Taylor Swift is making, for instance, uh, you have to build a model that is sustainable in the way that her tour is, you know, <laughs> and that that's not just about your bottom line. I mean, the bottom line is important for any business. And I don't I'm not here to say that's not important. Obviously, a business is a business. Sure. Um, but at the same time, it's like every organization, every company around the world at this point has an a, a HR department. Right. Every company has people coming in to do workshops and and to motivate people and figuring out how to maintain morale and wellness in the workplace. Now, are they always successful? Maybe not, but at least there is the attempt to try to incorporate that into what they're doing. And so I think that the music industry and the entertainment industry in general, in general is, it, it should be no different. You know, I mean, I think that um, had I been going out on the road in 2002 on the album songs about Jane, and instead of giving us, you know, instructions on uh, media training and and then and how to, you know, basically party like a rock star, uh, if there had been, you know, therapy and group therapy and uh, you know, workshops on ways to maintain your sanity in the course of of that lifestyle, um, perhaps I could have avoided some of the things that ended up being problems for me. Sure. Well, even as I hear you say that, I wonder. You know, I mean, it's a different world now, but also reading your book and, and listening in the hours, the way your days, even your days off were packed with, you know, photo shoots or, you know, a trip here, you know, another squeeze in another show, whatever, like it's money, right? You're talking about that bottom line. And I think what we want managers and producers and such to understand is that everybody wins when the artists are well. Just thinking about the bottom line, then you end up in a situation where you have a, a, a major problem that can be, you know, can seriously impact your bottom line on a bigger scale. Um, sure. You know, you've seen people, a lot of art, young artists canceling tours of late uh, in the last, certainly since the pandemic. I mean, that, that was a wake up call, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so, I mean, those kind of outcomes you know, when a, when a promotional company all of a sudden has, uh, you know, a eight or nine figure tour canceled, that affects their bottom line a lot more than, you know, whether or not they're giving their artists a, an extra day off each week, you know. Um, yeah. So it's, it's really just about weighing the pros and cons as much as it is about being a humanitarian, you know. Uh, and I, But I get it, you know, I mean, I, I'm very, very careful to lay this out in my book, you know, in describing this stuff, um, that I understand why we had a day off once every two weeks when I was on tour. Um, and, and when I say a day off, I mean, we were driving for 14 hours, you know, that was uh, day a day off. off, you know, playing, uh, Halo in the back lounge of your, of your bus, uh, while you're sitting, you know, on a highway. Um, you know, I understand why. And and this, in particular, the first couple of years when we weren't bringing in any income, really, you know, it was all on the record label's dime. Uh, and it was an independent label uh, that hadn't yet gotten the influx of cash from the major label. Um, so uh, arguing that, you know, we, we need more days off, you know, to put the whole band and crew up 
at a hotel, you know, uh, in an expensive city and allow us to just walk around and uh, buy a nice dinner and, and have some self-care. Uh, that was just not in the cards at that point uh, in terms of what could be afforded. And when you're starting a business, when it, you could look at it like an upstart, whether it's the record label or just our band, um, you know, you, the, the, everyone has to kind of, uh, uh, tie, you know, tie their, 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 their bootstraps tight and, and try to just soldier on and, and push through. Uh, but at the same time, it's not all or nothing, right? It's not like it's a matter of living like a king and having massages every day <laughs> or being slave to the grind and, and literally breaking down the way that I did. Those aren't the only two options, right? I mean, I think that there's, there's a balance to be struck. There's that word again, between yeah. extremes. Uh, make, build a more sustainable model. You're, if you're building a business, you want to build sustainability into that model from day one. Um, so that you uh, you you have a product that's out there for the long run, and that um, when it comes time to to do that eight or nine figure tour, and the, the, and you are on the level of a Taylor Swift or somebody like that, um, that it's a well oiled machine in which everyone is is profiting, but also um, doing well personally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you you said you know you were talking about pushing through, and you have a chapter in your book called Try Harder. Yeah. And, you know, you, you kind of circle back later. I've, I've just felt the connection between that chapter, but also later in the book when you were really struggling, when you said, wait, I wrote it down. You said, if I didn't care about anything, then nothing could hurt me like that ever again. And I think the, the reason why those go together for me is I think we have a lot of people, a lot of artists in all different genres, but a lot of people in the executive world, whatever it may be who are just trying harder, who are trying to not feel. So it's like they, they crash, right? They crash, they, they crash, they clash. We're trying harder to not feel. Right. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah. It's so interesting. I have more perspective on that chapter, try harder now than I did even when I wrote the book, because I've been speaking on this so much and I've learned even more about what, I was dealing with and why it led to the breakdown that it did. And I have a sort of a diagnosis for myself that I've never received a, a, a satisfying diagnosis from a mental health perspective of what I was dealing with. I mean, I had physical issues that received diagnoses. I, I had, you know, a lot of inflammation, tendonitis in my shoulder. I had something called um, thoracic outlet syndrome, which was a nerve condition. But in terms of what was causing those things, why it was wrapped up in my in my psychology, uh, I've come to understand it as something called musician's dystonia or focal dystonia, which is essentially kind of a like a, a stress response or even a trauma response in which your body um, identifies something you're doing over and over and over again as a threat. And so rejects it and starts not allowing you to do it anymore. And for me, that was not, it was not able to coordinate playing the drums anymore. And a big symptom of that is this sense of, I'm just not trying hard enough. Like I need to try harder. And, and so much of that mindset was tied up in that, but also it was tied up in my, the things that made me susceptible to that in the first place, because I was perfectionistic. I was um, sort of obsessive compulsive. I was somebody that, you know, defined myself by my accomplishments and by my ability to be, to do everything that I did at the highest level and do it well. So there's a lot of pressure I was putting on myself. And when things weren't going well, or when I was feeling worn down or, or like it was not as easy as, as I wanted it to be, my only solution was to try harder. It was to push through and it was to just so these vulnerable feelings that I'm having, push them out of my mind, push them down and just uh, try to control it more, right? Exert more control over something that I felt like I was losing control over. And that's a really tough spot to be in when you feel like you don't have control over something and yet you're trying to exert control over that thing. And so it just kind of became this downward spiral where the, the harder I would try, uh, the harder it would become. And it almost seemed like there was like an inverse proportion <clears throat> between effort and outcome. 
And the reality is that's almost exactly what it was. It was, I was bearing down and grabbing the sticks too hard, trying too hard, not just allowing it to happen. And it was compounding it. And the more that would happen, it was making it more difficult for me. Um, being so obsessive and so compulsive about uh, trying to overcome this, this fatigue and this, this um, lack of coordination and control. And, and the, the quote that you referred to is later in the book has to do with how, how I was dealing with the, the loss of that, not just career, but you know, my whole identity that was wrapped up in, in being the drummer of Maroon 5 and how devastating and, and difficult that was for me to do. Um, and so I think essentially I, my coping mechanism at that point was to become entirely nihilistic. Uh, I just, I don't care about anything anymore, you know, no meaning to anything, no purpose, because it was so painful to lose something that was so meaningful and so purposeful that the only way I could see coping was to not care about anything. If I don't care about it, then it can't hurt me, right? But essentially what I sacrificed in in doing that, in trying harder not to care in that context, was I gave up that which is essential to our being as human beings, which is creating meaning in our lives. At the, I do believe as I'm sort of an existentialist by nature. I think that our, our, that our biggest driving force more than any other instinct <laughs> that we have is to create meaning in our lives. And that, you know, one of the things that causes us great anxiety as the existentialists talked about uh, is that, you know, inherent meaning can be elusive. You know, if you're just sitting around waiting for meaning to bonk you on the head, uh, you can get pretty, uh, anxious and depressed and realize like it's uh it's not inherent necessarily that that i experience meaning and purpose in life and that we have to create those things for ourselves and we have to believe in something and first and foremost we have to believe in ourselves right so since i had lost the ability to believe in myself and i had robbed myself of the investment in a sense of meaning and purpose in my life i essentially was you know committing myself to a life of depression and anxiety, um, just suffering through and trying to self-medicate at that point in my life the best I could, just escaping those feelings, pushing them out of my mind, and again, trying harder to not feel. Uh, but you, you can only run so fast from these feelings, right? And you can only run for so long. They catch up with you the sooner or later. For sure. And I think it's so ironic that we inevitably often cause the very thing that we're trying to avoid, right? We don't want to feel pain. We don't want to feel loss. We don't want to feel grief. We, we don't want to feel emotional pain. And so we try to get ahead of it or we try to stuff it down. And it's almost like we just get there faster. That's very true. It's very true. Um, yeah, we, we can, some, I, I think one of the things that I realized that was a motivating factor in my recovery was realizing that to a large extent, I was the maker of my own misery at a certain point. You know, it, it, it was unfortunate that things happened the way they did. And of course, if I could go back and do them over, I would have done them a different way. But at the end of the day, you know, the past is in the past. And the things that were really painful um, had their effect. And what was holding me back from finding new purpose and meaning and happiness and fulfillment in my life was the ways in which I was running from dealing with all of that. You know, it was the self-medication. It was the avoidance of discomfort. Um, it was the, uh, the, the fear of change, the fear of the unknown, of taking on new challenges. Uh, I, was, I was keeping myself. And at a certain point, it was no longer just dealing with the grief of all of that that was in the past. It was I was keeping myself in that place of misery by uh by by doing those things by self-medicating and avoiding and running and and uh and not allowing myself to start to walk through the feelings and 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 take on new challenges so it was when i finally thankfully was humbled enough to recognize that my way of doing things was part of the problem and and not part of the solution that i was able to to ask for and receive the help that i needed in walking through that challenge of change and, and overcoming the fears of that and, and finding uh, new solutions than the ones that I'd been trying, uh, but had been really part of the problem. Yeah. 
I, I appreciated the part of the book where you told the story about when you moved back home and you were, you talk about your nervous system. And so your partner was, had already developed her own kind of rhythm with life mm -hmm. and it was slower and more mundane. And then you do such a beautiful job. And I think every person listening to this would benefit from hearing a little explanation about how you were, which we all are, like your nervous system was conditioned to this high energy. And so you were finding, you said you were finding that you were having panic attacks in the evening, even though there wasn't anything wrong. So can you speak a little bit to how our nervous system responds when maybe we're not aware? Because again, I think a lot of people think there must be something wrong with me. And when you understand how your nervous system is trying to protect you, you have a lot more clarity and a lot more hope, and it's a lot easier to ask for help. Yeah, well, for me, it was interesting because I, you, the touring and performance at, at night after night is is not a it's not a lifestyle and it's not a rhythm in terms of the nervous system that most people are used to. Um, and I mean, think about it. You spend a lot of hours, even if you're you're as busy as we were. In particular, when you get to the point when you're a, a headliner. Uh, you have a lot of hours where there's downtime. Um, you know, at a certain point, right before I came home from tour, we were uh, playing arenas, you know. And so d there were long hours that we were in a, a not a dressing room, a, a, a locker room, <laughs> which was turned into a dressing room. Um, and you couldn't really go anywhere because there were 20,000 pe people out there waiting to see you. So you, you would get mobbed if you went out there. And you might have interviews and you might have... Um, you know, other things that you were doing in your, in your dressing room, but essentially uh, there was a lot of downtime. And then all of a sudden at about 10 o'clock at night, every night, you have to get up for the most epic level of, you know, dopamine and uh, you know, adrenaline and all, all of these, uh, I mean, just this excitement level uh, and your nervous system is, you know, you could look at it as being in fight or flight. You could look at it as just, being hyper stimulated, it, that's what it is, really. You know, you're hyper stimulated between the lights and the volume of the the sound and the extent to which you're engaged in a process that's all consuming, and it's a lot of fun and it's exhilarating, but it's it's a rhythm that's like very uh, extreme. You know, from like low energy a lot of the day to all of a sudden for an hour and a half, extreme stimulation and high energy, and then having to come down from that and try to go to sleep and get a good night of rest because you have a long day of travel or interviews or whatever the next day uh, is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, so that's what my life looked like at the end of the touring for me. And then you take that home when I, when I wasn't able to perform and I had to go home and do, you know, go to a lot of different doctors and, um, and, and try to figure out if there was a solution to what I was dealing with. And, my girlfriend back home, we, you know, we had a one bedroom apartment in LA and she was, uh, you know, working a normal job. And so she had a normal rhythm that we most, most people experience of, uh, the rise and fall of the day. That's, it's not hyper stimulation and it's not, uh, it's not low lows and high highs. It's just, there's a, there's a rhythm to it. And then you go home and you go to sleep and you get up and do it again. And on the weekend you blow off some steam, but you know, there's a natural rise and fall and rhythm to that. And then here I am, uh, on this whole other rhythm. And it was very apparent to us that our nervous systems were in very different places. And, and now here I am, you know, feeling sorry for myself that I'm not able to be out there on the road with the guys. Uh, so feeling depressed, feeling anxious and cooped up, and then trying to get to sleep at 11 or 12 o'clock at night when I would have been on stage. And I would have had the bright lights and the huge sound and the feeling of exhilaration and purpose. And instead I'm trying to, you know, recalibrate to the normal rhythm that most people have where they're winding down at that hour. Um, and it was really challenging. And I, it actually, you know, there's a lot of reasons why it turned into panic attacks for me. And part of it was just that my heart would start racing when I was laying in bed and I would just have to get up and go for a walk. Um, but there was also trauma, you know, involved in it for me. There was breaking down on stage uh, night after night over a long period of touring, um, you know, 
I, I think that, that I was reliving some of those experiences of feeling like I was really drowning on stage um, when I was laying in bed and, and sort of um, feeling my heart racing, feeling my body um, getting, you know, picking up the way it would had I been on stage at that hour. And so for a lot of reasons at that point in my life, I was experiencing uh, what I would describe as a trauma response that became nightly panic attacks. And that's when the drinking started uh, creeping up. So, I mean, the nervous system and the way that these things manifest, trauma manifests in the body in that way. We, you know, we talk about the body keeps the score. That's the way in which it happens. You know, your nervous system basically, uh, you know, integrates this experience of extreme stimulation that comes from something that is um, traumatic. And then, you know, you, you, you bring that home with you and you have to recalibrate to normal living, but now you have this thing wired into your nervous system that you have to get up and be ready to perform in some way. Um, that's what happened for me. And that's what I think a lot of people probably experience when they're living that lifestyle and having to recalibrate to normal life after that. You're in a great place now. And I would ask how much of the joy, contentment, healthy relationships you have today, do you attribute to your success as a, as a musician? Well, I mean, I, I think that the success that we had gave me a lot of freedom um, in my life. I think that it's hard to imagine where I would be were it not for that, because my life would be very different. So to sort of pull that out and say uh, it had no effect would be difficult. Uh, at the same time, you know, my life is really not necessarily about music or that life very much anymore. Uh, the things that I'm doing are largely, um, you know, more, di more directed and come from a place of being of service. Um, and, you know, writing the book, has been one of the most, was maybe the most fulfilling process I've had in recent years. And um, because it, at the at my core, I think I'm a creative person and it was another project that was uh, very much, you know, a sense of, of purpose and, and flow for me. It was something that I was very much in it in a really engaging and fulfilling way. But that being said, you know, that book obviously doesn't exist if, if my past and music <laughs> hadn't informed it. And, and, and so, you know, you can't they're inextricably linked. You can't really disconnect the things I'm doing now from the, the things I was doing then completely. Um, a lot of times people are running from like childhood trauma. And mm -hmm. you've spoken that that's not really your situation. Right. Yes and, and no. I mean, the thing is that uh, I didn't experience any overt childhood trauma. I was very blessed to have a very loving, supportive family. Uh, there was no abuse or neglect or any kind of you know addiction or anything in my household. Um, so yeah, in that regard, there wasn't there weren't those origin stories that you hear about in that regard. However, um, I do recognize that the inter intergenerational trauma was a factor. You know, my parents both. Uh, experienced trauma in their own lives and even some that was passed down uh, through the, through their ancestors. Um, and and I, I have a friend who's a trauma specialist who, who said something to me that was really interesting and I hadn't thought about it in this way. When we talk about trauma and how it's passed down, it's not necessarily the trauma itself that's passed down. It's the coping mechanisms that get passed down, right? It's the ways in which one person had to cope with their trauma that affects the next generation and so, you know, in for in terms of my parents, both loving, wonderful people, they gave me a lot of great things in my childhood. Uh, you know, my mom has some PTSD from her childhood. She has the anxiety and depression she has dealt with in her life. Uh, and that has made her a very sensitive person. In some ways, that could be challenging. In other ways, it was wonderful. So, I mean, I, I, I you know, I think I dealt with temperamentally being maybe more sensitive, um, and more like my mom in that regard, which was both both has both allowed me and given me the gift of being an empathic person, being a compassionate person, but also having my own challenges with anxiety and depression and 
um, and some of the coping mechanisms that might have not have been as helpful. And then on the other side, my dad, you know, is an opposite extreme in that he had his own traumas and his coping mechanisms are that he's, uh, you know, a control freak, you know, and a type A personality and, and just uh, kind of hyperactive and always going and doing and fixing and, and caring for people. And again, wonderful, beautiful things that can be very helpful, but also can have problems when, uh, when not balanced. Right. And I think I inherited those things from him. I think that I inherited my work ethic and my sort of uh, perfectionism and things like that from him. Um, but also I inherited this sort of hyper focus and obsessive compulsive nature that can be at, at times uh, a challenge as much as it is a blessing. So I think that those those things that were passed down through the generations certainly informed my story, but it was the actual trauma that I experienced happened much later. Again, though, it's interesting. I've, I have learned even more since I've written the book. And I, I have, at the time that I wrote the book, I looked at, you know, the breakdown that I experienced on the road as the trauma that I've had to overcome, the thing that, that drove my addiction, uh, the thing that drove the major anxiety and depression that I dealt with. Um, but I, I, I allude to it in the book, but I have better understanding of it now that that those things existed before that happened, right? Um, you know, I, I think that the, the the breakdown that occurred and as devastating as that was, um, was really the ultimate culmination of things that had occurred in smaller versions before that. That's why I included it in the book, you know, the story with, with baseball that kind of mirrors the breakdown that I had later in a smaller form. Um, and I think that even some of the experiences that I had in that regard um, were traumatic in their own ways and kind of set the stage for the later traumas that came because, you know, I had injuries that I, I tried to play through. And I, you know, we talked about this earlier, the, 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 the encouragement that I got, the kind of feedback that I got from the culture of the athletes, the, the, the coaches, the peers was just to tough it out. It was just to try harder and not, uh, you know, you weren't supposed to complain. And I was playing through pain and I was playing through injury and I, there wasn't a space for me to be allowed to, to show vulnerability. And that was traumatic for me because um, I, that ended up with me putting myself in positions that weren't safe, that were causing more injury because I didn't feel safe speaking up and saying I was in pain and, and then getting bullied, you know, and being called a wimp or whatever, a, a worse word than that um, when I just couldn't hack it anymore. Um, and so you take that, the tracks had sort of been laid in that mm -hmm. regard. And then you put myself in a high pressure situation where I'm putting my, a lot of pressure on myself and the intersection of those things. And then on a scale where the, the stakes were much higher. Um, and then I had a, a, a significant breakdown that impacted me in a, in a more significant way. And so ultimately that was the moment when things in my life were, were, most impacted and, and most affected, but, uh, but that wasn't the beginning of the story. Sure. Well, we're back to the nervous system, right? Like your nervous system remembers, like, it's not safe to say you're in pain, it, you know? So even as an adult, you were, you know, your brain was conditioned, your nervous system was conditioned in little league, you know, that like, just keep going, push through, don't, don't complain. And, you know, like you said, when the stakes are that much higher, it's the tracks were laid. I like, I like how you said that. Um, so the work of a warrior is when we take care of ourselves first so that we can have a greater impact on the world. And when we are well, people around us benefit, right? They, they're, they have a better chance of wellness and more joy and things like that. What do you do on a regular basis? Like, do you have non-negotiables that you do to maintain your mental health? Absolutely. You know, a, a lot of people that I that I meet, have met in recovery from addiction, will say that, you know, sobriety is their number one. Uh, and some people can't understand that. They say, well, even above, you know, your, your family, your kids, your spouse, your work, um, sobriety is number one. That's kind of selfish, as some people might think. And the reality is, uh, you know, those people would tell you, if my sobriety goes away, I'm not helping any of those things. I can't be a good parent. I can't be a good partner. I can't, my work suffers. My, my whole life could fall apart uh, if I don't, you know, make my sobriety number one. So I get that completely. Now for me, 
I have a slightly different take on that. I, I would say that self-care in general is number one. Um, because sobriety for me, you know, is, is really just a way of life. Um, I would just as soon, you know, drink arsenic as I would drink alcohol at this point, because I know it's just entirely toxic for me. That's not for everyone. There are people that are able to, to drink moderately and doesn't affect their life in a negative way. For me, I'm not, I'm not willing to take that risk. So it's not even really on the menu for me at this point. Um, and so it's not a daily thing for me. Like I need to figure out how to stay sober today anymore. Thankfully, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, however, um, you know, self-care, making sure that I'm taking care of myself to a degree that I'm putting myself in a position to be most well, mentally, physically, uh, spiritually as well. Uh, you know, and from a holistic perspective, taking nourishing, not just my body, but nourishing my mind and my soul. You know, uh, th those are the things that allow me to be the best version of myself on any given day, which might not be always, the, you know, the best, best version of me. You know, we all have our limitations and we have good days and bad days. But the best version of me on that day, given the circumstances of that moment in my life, um, is going to be achieved if I'm taking care of myself, which means that I'm going to be the best version of myself I can be on that day in my relationships, in my work in the things that I do creatively and just in my experience of living, the, the pleasure that I take from the things that I do and the ways that I'm able to be present for the things in my life. So it's, you know, some of that stuff is very simple. I mean, for me, it's just, I know that if I don't get enough rest, if I don't get enough sleep, everything suffers. My mood is worse. I'm not a pleasant person to be around. Uh, everything feels like a chore. My work suffers. Like, I'm not helping anyone if I don't make sure that I prioritize that first and foremost. Sleep is a number one and I, I can't compromise that. Like if somebody says to me, hey, I got this big thing you could do uh, at 10 o'clock tomorrow night and then this big thing to do at eight o'clock the next morning, I'm like, that's not going to work for me. We're going to have to find a different way to do that, different timing, because one of those things is going to suffer and that's going to throw off my week and I'm going to be making up for that, you know, that night where I didn't get enough sleep. And, and so it's, it's like, I have to prioritize that. I have to make sure that that's a big part of my self-care and it, and it extends to everything in terms of the body, you know, it's exercise and, and, and diet and all that stuff within reason. I mean, you know, there's a balance to life. I don't think you have to be, um, the, the, the perfect, you know, <laughs> there, the yeah. perfection is an illusion, you know, just the, the healthy version of me as much as I can in all of those regards. Um, and like paying attention to what, makes you feel certain ways right right, right. being you feel when you're hydrated <laughs> you feel yeah. better when you have fruits and vegetables as opposed to cake and cookies <laughs> like what makes you feel good yeah i've realized i mean especially being a sober person you know obviously I, I i understand the extent to which you know drinking alcohol was toxic for me but even having been to that ex that extreme I, I think i'm much more tuned into like how things affect me now so like if i have a little bit too much caffeine or sugar or or too many carbs or, you know, um, I notice how I feel different, you know, and that's not to say that I can't have any sugar ever. I can't have any carbs. It just means, you know, be mindful of the balance of things and to make sure that in general, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, uh, conscious of, of the choices that I'm making that affect how I feel. And that extends, uh, you know, to your psychology and to your, your spirit. You know, um, I know that, for me, you know, a lot of the things that I do are, are it's heavy work. You know, you're dealing with people that are having uh, emotional, um, you know, challenges in their life and, and or really just heavy moments in their life where they're dealing with loss or transition. And if, if I add to that, um, you know, watching a lot of the news that's telling me all the terrible things that are going on on a daily basis um, and and not careful about the extent to which I'm constantly putting really heavy dark things in, in my mind and, and soul, um, then I'm, I'm, you know, I, my experience of living is going to be one sided. And so I try to do things that embrace a lighter side of my being. Uh, for me, you know, playing sports is a way to connect to my youth and, and my inner child. Softball is, is a very um, innocent way of connecting to my first love and passion of, of baseball at this point in my life. Uh, it's something I, I, I do now a couple times a week. Um, 
and I realize I look forward to that because it's like when I'm playing, I'm, I'm, I'm completely immersed in a flow activity. It's something that has immediate feedback and, and it's a challenge and it's, but it's also just, you know, feeling like I'm 12 years old again and just competing and having fun and exerting myself, except the stakes are much lower now. It's just, it's yeah. just fun and, 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 and uh, getting together with a bunch of people and playing the game, you know, Everything so. You mean, coaches. <laughs> right, right. So it, it, so I, to me, that's a big part of my self-care because it's nourishing my my inner child and it's giving myself something that's not heavy and not dark. And 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 then, you know, just being mindful of the things that lift my spirit up. You know, it's like if I'm going to listen to some, some heavy rock, I might want to listen to something that's happy and, and uplifting as well. Uh, if I'm going to watch a movie that's about, uh, you know, uh, torment and and loss or, or existential angst. Uh, then I might want to, you know, follow that up with something that is reminds me of of love and and uh, and joy, um, and just and recognizing that my spirit and my my soul needs that nourishment as much as my body does. So much self awareness. I would say <laughs> self attunement. Attune, attune, attune. You are yeah. very self attuned. Um, I love it. Okay, I will only ask you two more quick questions. <laughs> <laughs> One, what would you say to a new artist coming into the industry, whether it be music or acting or, you know, any entertainment form of entertainment, what would you say to a new person in the industry? I would say two things that I would say to my younger self, if I could go back in time. Um, one is, you know, I think when I was, uh, when I was going into this, into that world, seriously, professionally, I didn't want to see it as a job. And I didn't want to see it as, um, you know, I had been an athlete, I had been academic, and I saw this as art, and I saw it as expression, and therefore a very different world. And I didn't want to think of myself as an athlete, having to perform at a high level in that way. And I didn't want to think of it as um, a job in which I had to perform uh, with a certain level of expectation I wanted it I wanted it desperately to just be fun and to be um an uplifting connecting experience a spiritual experience um but there's that's that's an element of it but there's so much more to it that to do it at the highest level you do have to to a certain extent treat yourself uh like an athlete or like anyone who's being asked to perform at a high level in anything even if it's not it doesn't feel that way. Even if when you get on stage, you're just, it feels like fun and you feel like I just want to sing and I just want to dance or I just want to play my guitar or whatever it is. Um, the reality is that that life, once you are living it at that level, the demands are going to become greater and greater. And you will have to treat yourself with the kind of self care that is required of somebody that is at the high level of any, any level of performance you know, it, there was a time, especially in baseball, I think, when you could have a gut, you know, and get out there on the mound and, you know, after a night of drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, and that was par for the course. In this day and age, it's not, you know, I mean, I think it's probably exceptions to the rule, but in general, everyone out there in that field has a routine on a daily and weekly basis that is very much wrapped it up in how they're, you know, making sure their body is able to perform at that level day in and day out. And, and, and psychologically and emotionally, how they're able to, to deal with the stress of that. So I think that if you're, if you're being mindful of that before you are there, you're going to fare a lot better when you get there than if you all of a sudden are in that situation, you haven't been taking care of yourself. The demands that are on you now are not things you've been prepared for or been, um, you know, working towards, you know, in, in terms of how you are going to manage and cope with those things. Um then all of a sudden you're dealing with all that. It's, it's a little too late, you know. Uh, you're probably already breaking down before you've even developed the skills to figure out how to cope with it in a healthy way. So as much as it's no fun to think of yourself and take yourself that seriously as a performer, um, I, the performers that I see that, that, that maintain a career and are able to uh, stay at that level are people that, that learn how to turn it into both passion and fun, but also consider it a career and a job and a, and something that requires a, a lot of, of time of, of 
caring for those elements that will prepare you for those things. Um, the second half of that, the other, the other thing I would say is uh, as a young person, and I don't know if this applies to everyone, but it certainly applied to me, and I'm sure it applies to more people than uh, that would probably admit to it. Um, people of all ages, but in particular young people, uh, tend to have defensiveness when it comes to, um, you know, being open to criticism uh, or staying teachable. I know for me, being sort of perfectionistic, I held myself to high standards, but if I recognized something that I I hadn't really learned, I wasn't really good at, and there was some level of me having to admit fault or or accept criticism or take a suggestion, I would get very defensive. It's, you know, the, the pride of youth. Um, and I think that for people that are very invested in their art and in their craft, um, it can be hard to take suggestion or criticism. And um, I think that... Uh, the best advice that I could give is to stay teachable, to stay open to the idea that we're we're always learning, we're always uh, hopefully <laughs> growing uh, and finding new and better ways of doing things. That you know, if you can incorporate those things and, and have a, a mindset of growth, a mindset that um, if something is challenging, there's an opportunity there to learn and to grow. Uh, it's not a threat. It's not something that's going to make you look bad. It's it's another it's another avenue to to walk down that could be fulfilling, that could offer you something that you don't already have that can enhance what you do even more. Uh, that goes a long way, you know. Whatever you're as an actor, it's being able to take direction. As a writer, you know, you know, taking criticism. As a um, as an artist, you know, recognizing well that didn't work. So let me try this. Let me try something different that I haven't tried yet. Um, you know, and 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 just just being teachable, just being open to to what might be actually helpful to you in your process. Love it. So my last question, I have a disclaimer, a generalized disclaimer, that you know this podcast is not certainly not a replacement for mental health care or treatment, but as someone who has wrestled with depression, anxiety, perfectionist tendencies, addiction, what would you offer as encouragement to someone who is suffering in silence? Well, um, I think, you know, it's part of the reason why I have made it my mission to tell my story, you know, at first writing the book and then promoting it and speaking about it is that we do need, um, you know, role models and we do need stories that help people see that they're not alone. Um, the reality is, and it sounds cliche is you're, you're not alone. Um, uh, whatever you're feeling, there are a lot of other people out there right now feeling the very same thing. Um, however, you know, whatever you're dealing with, it can feel very isolating. Um, especially when you're not reaching out and connecting with people about it. Um, uh, it's kind of ironic. It's something we were talking about earlier in terms of like the very thing that, that, um, what help you most is what you're avoiding or the very thing you're doing to cope is actually making it worse. The first tendency with so many things is to isolate, right. Or to pull away or like to assume that people aren't going to understand um, that there's going to be stigma, that there's going to be. Um... And so the advice that I give to people that, that, that are caregivers or family members or friends uh, is, you know, the best, gift you can give to somebody who's struggling is to give you give them the avenue to connect give them the opportunity to express what they're uh isolated with or bottling up um you know the you know when you ask somebody I, when you tell somebody i want to understand what you're experiencing not let me fix it for you not let me uh give you a solution but help me understand i want to understand what you're going through um, you're offering somebody a gift because connection is it goes such a long way in terms of battling the things that, you know, what's the opposite of connection? It's isolation, disconnection, uh, you know, spiritually feeling um, alienated and, and, and not a part of something larger than ourselves. And so as a starting point, being plugged in, feeling 
in the same way that music in my teen years helped me feel connected and and helped with those feelings of alienation and and uh disillusionment you know the solution to so many of our issues is 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 as a starting point is feeling something that we can connect to that is bigger than ourselves that allows us to feel seen to 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 feel understood uh and to feel represented um because again if you're feeling it there's probably a lot of other people out there feeling it um so we need those stories we need people to represent um in a way that is connecting, but also that is uplifting, that allows a solution or offers hope that there are solutions. Um, but I think that also the other part of that answer is what I just said in the previous question. It's being open, you know, because our defense mechanisms a lot of times is like, well, nobody will understand. And um, it's scary to to open yourself up to the idea that somebody might have something that could be helpful or that it will require, you know, change. It will require stepping into uncomfortable spaces because we sometimes get so comfortable in our own misery that we can't see that the thing that we're we're avoiding is actually going to help us. And so being open to that change, being open to walking into those uncomfortable spaces, that might actually be the thing that helps you most. That goes a long way as well uh, to finding some solutions. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, we are, we, we get used to, you know, coping with things a certain way. And, you know, what I always tell my coaching clients is, you know, we don't have to be mad about it, right? Those coping mechanisms kept you alive and now Mm -hmm. they're hurting you. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes, like you said, that change can be so scary. Um, But, you know, going through it, I think you said the only way through it is through it, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) The only way to get through it is to go through it. And I think that's so well said because on the other side of it, it's so liberating and your story is such a testimony to that. So thank you for being here and sharing your story and your wisdom and your experience. And I'm just really, really grateful. Thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, this opportunity to speak on, on all these topics today. This is uh, a lot of fun. So again, thank you very much, Ryan. Where can people find you and your book and the work that you're doing as a therapist? Well, the uh, one-stop shop, of course, is my website, ryandusick.com. That'll have everything that has to do with my book and uh, and my work as a therapist and coach and speaker. Um, of course, you can pick up my book on Amazon or anywhere that they sell books. It's harder to breathe. That's it, right there. <laughs> um, and then uh, if you want to keep up with me, you know, in terms of social media uh, on Instagram at Ryan Michael Dusick, I post old videos, new videos, a lot of stuff pertaining to my past and my present uh, all rolled into one. So that's kind of fun. Uh, so those are kind of the main spots. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very grateful. And just thank you for all that you brought to the work of Warriors today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.